Marks Community College. How many are um, currently taking the bioinformatics workshop at Bronx? How many have taken it previously? Okay, that's good. Well, um, I wanted to talk today about um, <coughs> vitamin B12. It's sort of my passion. Oops. Has been for about 15 years or so. And um, it's a very interesting molecule. So I'm going to try to focus on uh, its applications in HIV AIDS. But I'll give some background as to its uh, unique properties. And let's see. So um, how are we? Oh, is it page down? Page down? So let me show you the structure of um, vitamin B12. It's a very uh, complicated structure. It's, in general, the largest organic compound that's used as a coenzyme um, in the human system, and uh, animals as well. It's about 10 times as large as most amino acids which are single molecules that ultimately come together to make proteins. It has a very um, convoluted structure. In the middle, you see that cobalt with a plus sign. It, it's the only um, biologically active molecule that has cobalt, uh, which is a transition element that has you know, a number of um, unpaired electrons in the D orbitals, if you remember those. And you see the um, central um, ring system. It's a corin ring. It's not completely aromatic, so it's not flat. Parts of it are flat, parts are puckered. So because of that, it can have some variability as to the puckering. You know, and that may have some function in terms of its biological activity. Um, and it also has a phosphate group and a ribose. Let me just, this is the uh, phosphate group and a ribose. It's actually, it's not the normal ribose. The, um, this OH group would normally be down, or rather I should say this base would be on the, on the flip side, normally. So it's a little different in that regard, and this is not the normal nucleotide. If you take this whole, group here, the phosphate and the sugar, it's a cyclic sugar, and this dimethyl benzo ring, it's called nucleotide. So it's very unusual. It has, so it's sort of a hybrid structure in many ways. They're very unique. There's nothing else like it. There are coronoids that are derived from it and whatnot, but it is um, unique in, in many regards. Um, <clears throat> This is called coordination complex, you know, with the aromatic rings, four nitrogens, plus the nitrogen to the nucleotide. And also this position here, which is presently in this diagram, occupied with the cyano group, um, which is very stable and it's the most common form of uh, vitamin B12 and it's called cyanocobalamin. So the cobalamins are, uh, B12s, and the cyano has a, a, a cyano group. There's also hydroxo, aqua, there's also uh, glutathionyl, a tripeptide that's bonded, a very newly discovered one, and also uh, an, an S uh, adenosyl. So it's a, and, and it functions at the various levels um, for certain uh, coenzymes as a coenzyme that's necessary in order to um, actually to transfer methyl groups. So there's such an importance of methyl groups in biochemistry. If you methylate certain uh, nucleotides, certain genes, they can be either uh, shut off or shut out, or they can, they can cause uh, cancer or what have you. So it drastically uh, can 
uh, modify the function of a lot of large biological molecules. The difference between RNA, ribonucleic acid, and um, nucleic acid, deoxynucleic acid, there's two things different. There's a methyl group on cytidine that in instead of having uridine, so you put a methyl group and it changes, and so the base is different in DNA than it is in, in, um, in RNA. And the other difference is that you don't have an OH group, uh, uh, two OH <laughs> groups uh, in, the, uh, in the ribose. The deoxy means lack of a hydroxyl group. Um, so this, this particular uh, molecule has other unique um, structures and functions that I want to point out that I think haven't been taken into account by many people who have studied it. Uh, one of the things about vitamin B12 was discovered like in, 19, in the 1930s. The discoverers and the ones who concentrated got Nobel Prizes. The structure of it was done, I believe, in 1967 by Hodgkin. She got a, a the, the crystal structure. She got a Nobel Prize for that. Um, researchers in Harvard, maybe 20 years later, um, synthesized it from scratch. Very complicated molecule. And that was part of their work, and they got a Nobel Prize for that. And then maybe in the late 80s or so, another group did the quantum mechanical calculations on B12 to, to explain some of its reactivities. So it was part of their focus, and they got a Nobel Prize for that. Um, it's multifunctional. But now, look at these groups here. What do you see in common here? And how many are them? Do you know what this group is here when you have a, a carbon that's attached to an amino group and a carbonyl group? That's called an amide. Amide. And how many amides do you see here? How many? How many say five? How many say six? Seven. How many say seven? How many do you see? So if you non-substituted the six, which just has the NH2, okay? So can we locate them? One, two, three on one side, and one, two, three on the other side. And then someone, this is another amide, but it's substituted. And, and so, I mean, originally you might see that part of the structure, it makes these seven amides and then, and then tags on this uh, link um, through, an, it's, it's like an amino acid, it's a peptide, well, not quite a peptide, but it's a substitution here to the phosphate, to the ribose, or the sugar, to the nucleotide, and then back into the cobalt. So, so, okay, so one of them is sort of, has its function as a bridging with this uh, nucleotide structure. Now, what's the purpose of the other ones? Well, I mean, if you wanted to grab onto this, what would you do? And you want to identify this uniquely. Make believe you're a, a receptor or an enzyme, you know, which I often do. And then I look at a molecule and say, how would I grab you? Identify you, my eyes closed. You know the old thing about the, the elephant, right? The blind man and the elephant. The blind men, or blind women as well. One grabs the trunk, one grabs the, the tail, one grabs what? The big ears, and you know they describe it differently. But now, enzymes and receptors, they identify uniquely. They're very specific. And they can pick out a molecule out of several million, out of millions of other molecules that's floating by them, let's say the receptor could be on the cell surface of a, you know, and they can, there you are, and then, and then identify it and, and then do some activity that maybe they wiggle through the receptor membrane and something on the inside is, is activated. That's very often what happens. So if you have hormones that are secreted from your hypothalamus, which is between your ears and up your nose, 
in the most sacred part of your body. It's like the Holy of Holies. It's most protected. That's the, that's the uh, mastermind, the, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And then they send out signals to the rest of the body, to the organs, to do certain things. And then the organs get excited, and then they secrete hormones. So the, the endocrine system are peptide hormones and protein hormones, and then the small, um, the organs then also produce small molecules like testosterone and estradiol or cortisol or what ha or, or um, TSH, uh, should people know, thyroxin and T4 and T5, you know, from the different, from the thyroid, from the uh, gonads or from the kidneys. And then they go and make activities of all cells, of appropriate cells that they signal, and then, you know, maybe in the liver and the kidneys and whatnot. And then if there's extra, they, they're always circulating looking and then being bound because people can pick them out of the air with, in a split second and take them and gulp them and all that. And so they, their levels go down, but if they maintain high, they go back and circulate through the brain and normally they turn off the, uh, the negative feedback is to turn off the hypothalamus and pituitary. See, we got enough. And then they don't secrete the other ones. And then when the levels go down, the brakes come off, they synthesize some things, and boom, 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 boom. So you have this whole activity of how hormones work, and how, and how the receptors and the enzymes identify something very closely. So when I looked at that, I said, well, how, how, would, I, how would I identify amides? And, and you see, uh, amide, you heard of hydrogen bonding, right? From, from uh, G to C and R, and, um, and A to U. They're complementary, and these are the type of molecules. They do hydrogen bonding, usually an NH and a, and a carbonyl. With, with this, would, this would hydrogen bond to a carbonyl, this would hydrogen bond to an NH. So if I have another amide like this, and turn it around, it would be self-complementary. I'd have the NH2 going here, and the carbonyl going here. One hydrogen up, one over here. So that's what happens. So somehow, if I was going to recognize this, I would say, I need amides. And then, and then uh, there are two amide amino acids, asparagine and glutamine. You know, glutamine has like three carbons. It's a long chain one. And um, asparagine has two carbons, pretty flexible. But also, what I recognize that if you have a carboxyl group, a, a um, amino acid group, which is an amino group, which is NH3 plus, and then a carbon, and then a carbonyl, C, double bond oxygen, double bond oxygen. So I could also have a carboxyl group, one of the oxygens going here, and one of the um, amino groups going here. But, so I, so, so almost any amino acid might bind, but that, but, but here, what else is, present. Phosphate. A plus. So, what do you need for phosphate? Have you ever heard of, um, what are these um, proteins that jump around um, uh, DNA? They, they compact them. And what they are, they're proteins that are either high, so they interact a lot with the phosphate group sugar phosphate, that's the backbone of DNA and RNA. So they just wrap around and they wrap around and they wrap around and, and, they, uh, and they compact the DNA. All of your DNA is in every cell in the nucleus, all of it, in a tiny spot you can't see by eye. So imagine how compact it is. And maybe if you get all your DNA, you could draw it out that far. It gets to nothing. And you wouldn't be able to see the string even, you know? But if you have a lot of it together, did you did you isolate DNA, guys, from strawberries? Yeah. Yeah, and you saw it, right? Yeah. Also from, did you do from your cheek? Yeah. yeah. And it, it's like stringy, right? So that's magnified so much. So so the amino acids that I would pick would be uh, glutamine, probably, and then lysine, which has an NH4 
four plus. So it could hydrogen bond to the uh, oxygens and also would have electrostatic, minus one, plus one, which really is a strong bond. So in any event, I mixed this B12 with the certain amino acids and found that it had very important properties. It enhanced the properties of vitamin B12 so that it became more, um, it had enhanced uptake and both in cellular and in circulation. So it means that you take, a, and it was orally, an oral dose that could go in and be taken uh, throughout the system.